So let's have a look at this video and look at um, the story around the fiscal budget in South Africa. So we're going to look at these uh, analysis here, which is sort of giving us some insight about how ANC has been managing South African economy in the past 30 years and some of the things that maybe we may want to think about what is going on here. And I think there is a state of Victoria is kind of like going through the similar uh, similar sort of economic situation that we're seeing here in, in South Africa, kind of like mirror the same thing. What, what I mean by that is that when the country is having employing a lot more people in the public sector, so you're spending more money as a, as a government to pay for wages, and when you're paying for wages, we know that the wage, when it's higher up, it's actually going to be harder for that wage to come down. And that means, especially when you the government's revenue is going down, that means when you're seeing a rise in unemployment, which is what's happening in South Africa, it's been like this for a while, so high wages, uh, that it's very unlikely for the government to be able to reduce it unless those people retire, which is what they're talking about here in this episode. And yeah, to just to uh, try to cut up, cut on that spending on public wages. And so that's one of the things they can do. But also when you have this high up wages, when you and actually spending as a government, you're spending a lot of money to pay wages. Uh, it's really not going to help the economy of that country in the way that the government may intend it to. For example, it is my, because the, the wages for the government is usually more stable job so it doesn't really incentivize people to be more uh, innovative and uh, to be more productive and so the productivity goes down when you are employing a lot of people as a government when we're in employment the, 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 the employer is the government the productivity of that country goes down and we've seen that here, that story is similar to here in Australia. It is similar to South African story. And it's actually more mirror the Victorian story where you've got a lot more, they're spending a lot more money on the public wages than in private wages. And there's less more entrepreneur, less more people entering and starting new businesses as an entrepreneur similar story in fact in south africa this was actually anc is doing because they were entrepreneur before those puzzle shops in south africa were entrepreneur that were the people before anc took over so what anc was meant to do was to actually to make sure those small businesses in those community thrive through support and actually help them with what they need which is around Hat manufacturing, allow these illegal goods and things that they couldn't tax and that are getting through, through the country, that is going to drain the revenue because uh, the revenue of the government is from the tax. If you're reducing the tax, how are you going to tax people and increase spending because you've got more people you haven't accounted for? What's another thing that South Africa, that is so dumb about South Africa and ANC overall was that they had all these open border but they haven't actually budgeted for open border their resources like that they'll have more migrant going in and, and wanting to access the public health system the public health is, is infrastructure is actually you know, on the collapsing because I, a lot of workers that work there they are you know they work very hard on the resources uh, to try and to um, help people who are coming in through their doors who are very complex and many of them are 
illegal in the country and plus South Africans as well. So if your government having budgeted for that, that you would have a lot of people coming in your outside of your borders that you haven't accounted for in your budget, yearly South Africa is spending about 1.2 billion just treating people from neighboring countries. So that it should be another way that they can actually work in cutting the budget and cutting the budget to making sure that anyone that comes want to have treatment, a world-class healthcare services in, from South Africa, they need to pay for it first, pay it forward. I mean, the government, their government needs to um, pay before they can accept them. It's not about sending the bill because we know these people don't pay anyway. So they need to be focusing on that and reforming on that as well, moving forward, because they cannot just keep on spending credit card, credit card spending. I mean, spending, you know, doing all of that with credit card. Another thing that I think they need to be reducing the cost of the expenditure is on this private security. Why would you have a private security um, for your politician while the citizens, they live without any security? You brought in all these people that you have inverted for that you think there may be criminals into the country uh, you're protecting yourself as a government, but you don't protect your citizens. Because the way that I think, to be fair, is that you start by protecting everybody through your border, through allow into your country. Because when you know everyone that's there, is there for the interest of your country. I'm Australian, so I mean, I'm here for my interest of Australia. So if you allow somebody else to come in with the different interests and you can't vet them obviously you don't know where they're coming from uh, as the government as the other people who are elite you can protect yourself by hiring security by living in these uh, uh, neighborhood that you know they get it and and so on but the rest of the population they live like just like we live here in australia free you know without any any big walls and barbed wire and crap, all of that. So when you provide security for yourself, how about those who don't have security? So so if they're really is serious about cutting the budget, they need to cut on that. On the security they offer, the security, private protection security that they have in the government themselves. They shouldn't have any security themselves. They themselves should actually be vulnerable, just like the rest of South Africans, because if they continue that, they, then they don't relate with the everyday South Africans' experience with this level of crimes that is there, that is affecting most South Africans and well-being. As we speak today, we know about a lot of cases of people that are affected by crime. And crime does affect a lot of uh, well-being and your mental health and your in general anxiety and the way people feel about their security overall. So it is really way there's so those are the other ways that they can uh, cut the spending. So another thing I think they can cut the spending in is making sure they touch in their borders. If you don't have a very strong immigration, asylum and refugee policy that actually allows that you as a country to take on genuine refugees, like people who are really genuine refugees, and you are infiltrated by these people smuggling that's going on. People smuggling, we had this here in Australia, and fortunately, fortunately here in Australia, we had a very strong leadership that dealt with that at that time when it was a big problem. But South Africa is seeing their own people smuggling. So people smuggling, you can never manage and settle these people smuggling in South Africa through deportation. Deportation costs money. So the home affairs idea that they will be deporting everyone in South Africa who is illegal, it's wrong. But when you have no border, when you have porous border, you've got no fence, we've got no security, we've got no nothing to protect your citizens and yourself. So the start is start with investment to the border. So you get genuine 
uh, immigra immigrants in your country who can contribute to the success of the country and you can then vet your refugees and asylum. So what I think they need to do, they need to have the refugee center into the one border or any border that they have uh, within the border that needs to be a refugee center. So they need to draw a line of that was where the refugee center is going to be and, and declare that line as the refugee center admission. Why they need to declare it and be written down as that? That means that anyone that's entered there can be assessed that they are genuine refugee and it should not take a couple of days or a week for a person to be there. And then if they're not, that person can go back to where they came from. If the person enter and pass that line, then that person if they're found in a country, has no right to claim and, and file for any asylum. So that needs a change in the law, a change in legislation about what that line is, where is it, and no one, if anyone enter within those lines, then they enter and pass through that line, they are not they don't have any rights to to go to the court and remain within the country to do all the stuff they're doing uh, and go, you know, their claim being rejected for a number of, of years is still waiting. They don't have a rights. If he, they just need to be sent back. That is the change. You just need to find a way to change it out. Okay, so you end up with the genuine people. Genuine protection. People need genuine protection. All right. So another thing you need they need to work on and changing it. That is managing. This is in terms of managing the costs of deportation, managing the border, the borderless South Africa. Is that the idea that a person comes in as a visitor and then we get become a visitor and then they start uh, engaging with some relationship with somebody and they're illegal in the country then they start having they marry somebody and then through that marriage they try to remain in south africa that also needs to end because you know that we know that there's a lot of uh, fake marriages we saw the videos a couple of days ago in Devon of some people who were working and marrying people without their knowledge that needs to end so that means that if a marriage is occurred then that national, they need to go, go back to their home country and apply outside of their home country. And then they need to provide evidence of a genuine of genuine marriage, meaning that relationship of both side of the family, like your relationship with the friends, with the parents, and to make sure this is really a genuine marriage. It's not a fake marriage. I don't know why even to this point I haven't done that, because that's really dumb. Nobody should be coming into the country and then they're illegal. Once they, they realize they're illegal, they start engaging in these dodgy marriages. So it's dismantling all that. When you dismantle that and you say nobody who has been married within, and you have to backdate that, married within the country cannot be, anyone who's been married must reapply, must go back to where they came from and reapply when they're out of the country. And then with the clear security, with the country's national security and filing to check in they haven't committed any crime and yada yada. So this you can see that all of that, it is dismantling all of this stuff of illegality. Now another thing they to actually manage in the border, see how broad this is. It's actually looking at the um, the labor force, the labor force, the businesses that are exploiting these illegal migrants. The fine is actually a small amount, what they're fining them for. In fact, I would prefer that they look at percentage of revenues, uh, how much they earn per year, their filing of that, of that revenue, how much they claim every year, and look at the percentage, look at around 20% of their revenue. So if uh, 
a person in a business that person that runs a business last year they have the tax return say that they were in about 1.2 million that is going to be the 20 percent of that will be the fine and if they repeat the second time they're going to jail okay uh, so percentage of revenue and also and revenue as a standard flat rate and then look at how many people they have there and then multiply that by the number of people they here there and based on what if they had hired a south african citizen how much they would have paid for that south african citizens um including the the super which is australia's it's a super in south africa i think it's called uf uif uh they that type of money what the employer pays you for you when you are um, you know for retirement all of that they have to add in that and say for so example they pay a fine of breaking the law which is about 20 percent of their revenue and then multiply it by each person they find there who is unemployed who is actually illegal and that person they have to make sure that it's a yearly income that person that business would have paid for that person so that in itself would actually make it so difficult for the business to actually do this. Because at the moment, I'm afraid the whole thing labor is actually, it's useless. It doesn't actually, um, uh, the way that uh, they just this checking and going to the these businesses, I find that even like stupid because um you need to be able to actually find a way that people who are the businesses to see if the business is actually are telling you the truth. So at the moment, we know that a lot of businesses in South Africa, they have a lot of money cash on hand. Why they have cash at hand if the labor is so costly? Because they are exploiting these illegal migrants who are willing to be exploited. So there is a way to financially using the intelligence uh, to check if they are there's somebody that based on the revenue they make and how big the business are, how many people they have, they, they claim to employ, what in the books and to actually check and find out whether indeed those businesses are actually actually following the law or they are employing these people so that's another way you can just you need to see how really broad this is it's just not about having drones everywhere it's about managing the policy the of these it's actually driven by policy the nc government supported by da has allowed this it is driven by their policy that that's why you're right here with this high invasion of a lot of illegals in south africa it's because of the policy itself that is encouraged here of the exploiting because the thing is if you're illegal you're getting exploited you're getting you got no rights at so because you're illegal you know that if they find you you're going to be in be a process somewhere and then be deported and waiting for deportation that could take months and so on and it's very costly for the government as well so if you manage all of that you're going to dismantle the the model the business model of illegal migrants because that's their business model they have a business model these ones the illegal migrants have the business model so you have to be really smart and use all the brain cell once you do that they themselves they will realize that they cannot survive in south africa they will leave on their own you may not even be able to spend your money on this deportation because the the business of illegality is being dismantled on both fronts so they're not going to enter, they're not going to marry, they're not going to be able to do all of that. So you've dismantled everything. Once you dismantle that, then you can start having a very controlled migration. If you get someone who is asylum and refugee, my hope is that the government needs to resettle these people. It's not okay that you dump people in a community that you think black community where they get there there is not integration they engage in some sort antisocial behavior that are upsetting people who are already there giving them in a community where there's a lot of 
customs in the way people do things and then you bring them there they do all this thuggery stuff and all this stuff that not align with the community and they start fighting and you start the the mainstream and elite they call them xenophobic but when you look at that you you realize these people are fighting because it is a huge is a clash of culture they are, have different culture than the South Africans that they are being dumped there by the ANC government. That's another matter. So another thing that's more to do with budgeting here. So all of that illegal migration and stuff, they're all linked with the resources, like in school resources. Uh, they've cut the school's budget, they cut healthcare budget for many years now. If you are managing all of that illegal migration you're going to reduce uh the resources that are required to manage people are illegal in the country anyway so you're going to save money as a government you're going to save money uh on, in healthcare that we know that healthcare now we know how much it costs south africa to treat people uh who are coming and just and clock the hospital when you go to south african hospital south africans don't go to hospital because they're not going to be treated because when you get there, about 90, 98% of people in those hospitals are illegal migrants. They're not South African. So that's not a good way of you of using the public health system. You know, you and then they stand up with this huge budget which bill of uh, of illegal migrants that are treated, and then they can't claim it back to their countries. South Africa is not a Mother Teresa. You cannot act like a Mother Teresa. You need to be really careful about this. This budget of that deficit that's going so high, it's a big problem. Something must give and something must be uh, addressed here. And you must address it all front to ensure that you bring the budget back to surplus and increase productivity. So let's listen to this video and see what they're talking about after this mid-term budget in South Africa. Business editor Kolani Mbanjwa talks to us now. Kolani, good evening to you. So government will spend money to save money by enticing civil servants to take early retirement. What's the end goal here? Good evening, Oli. It does sound ridiculous, but it has some um, thought behind it, and uh, it's something that is uh, quite important for the government. It has done it before uh, in uh, 2019, where it was enticing those older civil servants who account for a larger part of the wage bill to take early retirement. As we know, retirement is at the age of 65 officially, but they are looking for those who are at the age of 55 and 59, and they are actually uh, putting aside 11 billion rands uh, for the next two financial years to make sure that uh, they're enticing these people uh, in order to uh, retire early to save money in the long run. You'll say how, but there's a lot of money that is being spent by the government. If you consider the fact that the number one single spending item on government books is the public sector wage bill, uh, followed by what it is spending on ESCOM to get 60% of ESCOM's uh, debt uh, under control uh, as it has taken that debt on. So that is quite a, a, an important one. Uh, and uh, he was saying also it's not only about getting the old wood out um, or the older people out uh, who are earning much more money, but it's also about trying to get younger people into the civil service. When it comes uh, to how the debt is, that uh, issue of um, for every rand that the government uh, collects in revenue, 22 cents is spent on debt service costs. And when you look at other things that uh, the government spends on, it actually leaves 20 cents for uh, new projects for every rand that is out there. It's something that is quite serious, uh, but uh, that uh, we are going to get more details on, uh, on later on in February. Let's talk about the low economic growth environment that's again been projected. What does this mean for jobs, service delivery? 
It's a, a sad state of affairs, really, when uh, opposition political parties, uh, unions, civil society afterwards described this. Uh so when you look at this one, this is the figure from 2008 to 2022. That was during Zuma's year. During Zuma's year, the South African uh, deficit was GDP to, uh, to death. It was really manageable, really good. It wasn't really that bad. But now you can see that it's under Ramaphosa. This is actually worse, absolute worse, because he hasn't added a single job. He haven't added a single job. This is what you get. This is what you get, and it increased this employment, public employment. No government actually increased productivity if they employ a lot of people. Employment should be driven by private health, private sector, not by the government. The government um, should be around the essential services, your, your, you know, your school, your healthcare, but not to other things. If you are the government that employs a lot of people and all of these stuff, these BEE and stuff and uh, tenders, they don't create any job. They don't create jobs. You know, you don't create jobs. You need entrepreneurs. You need to increase and have a driver and allow people to be entrepreneurs. And the township spazzes up with the element of entrepreneurs that you would see in South Africa when I was growing up there. So the fact that that was also has been actually been dismantled by in allowing these illegal goods into those market nearly ki and killing children, that's another problem. It's another matter for them. It is a uh, yeah, stupid. That's the reason why they're sitting at 40%. I mean, every time when I look at it, I'm thinking, geez, um, they've done so much damage. But when I analyze it and look at the data and realize, geez, this is really becoming a banana, banana state. The midterm budget policy statement as lukewarm, it is because it was indeed that. The budget uh, uh, issues aside, when it comes to economic growth, we know that our economic growth has been stagnant, and when you don't have economic growth, you therefore do not have money to collect uh, when it comes to revenue, and you can't... So you see, 48% of all government employees and between... 350,000 rands and 600,000 per year. Wow, that's 111.4 billion. Bill that was added to wages, the amount of wages the government, you can see that. It's rising, it's been rising. You see that, how it just follow if you put the line there from, yeah, from 2013 all the way up, you can see the the other projection 2023. So obviously the projection for this year is that it will be around 774 up there higher. But it is yeah when you go up from here all the way up here here in this line you can see that that is it is really the trend line you can see it's going upwards. You don't want that. That is ridiculous. This yeah it's not a good economy. Looking at that. We know that even in Victoria, the state of Victoria in Australia is actually similar. And I'm, yeah, I don't know, because the government is spending a lot of money on public wages instead of actually allowing private sector to take the lead. Invest that money in uh, those income generating projects and therefore you can't create jobs and stimulate the economy. And it's something that is quite serious that now the forecast for economic growth for this year has been revised downwards from 1.3% earlier this year to 1.1% right now. And that is a far cry from what the private sector told us, the captains of industry uh, told us uh, 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 three, four weeks ago during the partnership signing that they can actually stimulate growth to 3.3% in South Africa. The 1.1% is really, really low for a country of uh, uh, the needs and the inequalities in South Africa. And it is something to worry about that on the one side, you've got debt and on the other side you've got so many needs and at the same time you have the wage bill that is eating away uh, at some of that particular growth we need economic growth as a country and it is not happening fast enough yeah.
Just even that, the number of government employees earning over 1 million rands per year grew to 55,000 in 2023-2024 budget. I mean, financial year, 2023-24 financial year. That is huge. That is huge. And you can see that in 2013 20, and 2014 financial year, that was 10,000. 10,000. So how did we get to 55,000? From 10,000 to 55,000. That should have been the number there. It should have remained at 10,000, not 55. See? This is really there. 40,000, I mean, 10,000, so 55, really. Um, 35, um, 35,000. They go to 45,000. Yeah, 45,000 of these uh, jobs that are here in 2023 should go, should go back to 2013, 2014. We well, only had about 10,000 employee, employees there, and then you did not have this huge amount. That is ridiculous. See? why Ramaphosa is useless. I mean, this man is useless. This, that's why ANC is actually not succeeding. A lot of these left-wing party are not really good at managing economy. They're just not absolutely horrendous in managing economy. Uh, finally, and briefly, Polani, let's talk about uh, some positives that have come out of this in the medium term. Uh, speaking to the uh, finance minister, he did say that um, those teachers who are looking for jobs, who are graduates in uh, Eastern Cape and Guazul Natal, he might have something to say about them in February, uh, but he was explaining that uh, there was money allocated for the education department budget was cut the previous year, budget was returned, but it was not used to hire teachers. There are some uh, uh, good news on the side also of the public procurement bill, uh, because that bill, is its aim is to empower black people who have been marginalized by ensuring that you ring fence some of the government spending to go towards black businesses. It's something that is quite important um, for a, a, a country with a population that is majority black and that has felt marginalized. There have been other uh, positive issues that uh, the minister has spoken about in the taxi industry as well as getting the municipalities out of their electricity debt. But uh, the good news is that the forecast as well on load shedding is a summer that is bright. Uh, so this is actually uh, some uh, of the bright uh, good things that uh, have come out in uh, also on the side of the gray listing of South Africa. We are meeting those things that uh, the Financial Action Task Force has set down to meet uh, um, before the end of next year in order to be taken off the grey list and it is hurting our economic growth prospects. Yes, all of this uh, stuff about funding to the black economic empowerment, I have not seen any uh, benefit other than seeing the connected few that have benefited those who would already be privileged enough to be able to start their own companies and make their own money without any handout from the government. A lot of them, these programs. So they don't seem to be um, addressing the issue that is at hand. And I think most South Africans would agree that handing out all these programs, social programs, are not helpful. That's just my opinion. I don't think they're helpful, these social programs. And what is helpful is making sure that you regulate, you set the rules, and you actually open, make sure the market is open. 
and you don't allow illegal goods to enter us, you know, into those markets. This is how this government, ANC government, should have safeguarded the black community to don't allow any illegal goods open the market within the country, allow the, you know, more manufacturing within the country, do not allow all these illegal imported goods that we know now they are not safe anyway. People are not buying, they shouldn't be buying these products. I mean, if you're South African, do not buy any product without, I put some video before, do not buy a product without any any batch number, uh, manufacturer's detail, or any expiry date, anything that tells you about whether you buy a date, do not buy any chef product with that because we know that product like that are not being manufactured with that. Uh, following the good standards and all of that stuff you it's a government responsibility uh, to regulate and safeguard those industry making sure us the citizen can actually enter the market with our own goods and be active and be entrepreneurial and privately and you know stimulating the economy and trading amongst ourselves and increasing that productivity in those in industry that is the government's response maybe the government what it could do also maybe try and have you know uh, to an exchange programs where people can go to other countries and learn uh, what i would love to see anyway i would love to them because they're friends with the BRICS and take some of these youngsters, send them somewhere to uh, China, send them to Russia, have uh, an exchange programs and where they can learn how to do these things. That would be very much more productive and so that they can bring that those skills at home and create new industry. Uh, so if you're just throwing money for these BEE programs, we know that they don't work. They have not worked and they have failed dismally. If they have worked, the unemployment will be much lower today. It definitely will be much lower. And if the government had worked into making sure they, they themselves uphold the law, when you uphold the law, you make sure people don't break the law. You know the law and you you are you actually making sure that everyone that enters your country follow that law but if you're a lawbreaker yourself and you extort stuff you are alleged you've done committed heinous crime your credit you lose credibility and like citizen are going to not trust you and this is what we're seeing right now with the ANC so I don't know we I will be watching this and let's listen to this video and see if there's anything they say that would be more of interest to us. Let's listen. Colin Mbanjo, that's our business editor. Thank you very much for that summation of the midterm budget policy statement. Well, let's uh, stay with reaction to the mini budget. Uh, this budget has been welcomed by most parties in the government of national unity. It is quite important for, for, the, for the revenue to be distributed in the way it has been, 47 to national department, 42 to provinces, 10% uh, to, 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 to municipalities. That is an act of time to balance. Commitment to reduce the debt is a serious commitment because the cost of debt is the highest cost in the budget today. If we reduce the debt, will go a long way in balancing the way. And the last thing I want to talk about is the, is the Procurement Act. The Procurement Act is empowering the most neglected end of the market, the poorest of the poor. And those people who are going to be developing smaller businesses have an opportunity. Let them grab it and use it. Absolutely, and it's been a product of deep consultation within the GNU. Ashil Sarupa, the Deputy Minister of Finance, has been working very closely with the Minister of Finance and their counterparts. We believe it's the right diagnosis and this is the right remedy to get South Africa back onto the path of fiscal growth and fiscal sustainability. 
uh, we simply cannot continue with, continue on runaway debt, and I'm very grateful to see the debt control mechanisms there. Moving away from consumption spending to spending on infrastructure that will lead to investment in the country is exactly what we need to get the country moving. No further bailouts for state-owned entities. These are things we've been talking about for years but haven't done. So I want to commend Minister Gondongwan and his team. IFP Chief Whip Ntlantla Hatebe has welcomed the midterm budget. There is a lot of positives in it. Um, realignment, reprioritization, um, infrastructure development was uh, mentioned as being reprioritized, um, disaster relief, uh, 2.1 billion, um, the minister said was set aside for it, and 70% uh, of municipalities that uh, had applied for debt re relief um, were, are going to be approved. Um, so for us as the IFP, we think that uh, that is uh, um, um, quite um, a positive step by the minister um, towards the realization um, of the people's dream. So, yeah, thank you for guys for listening. This was just the economic analysis of what's happening in the market. So when you have a pharmaceutical science like degree like I have measuring in synthetic chemists, what are the key skills of, of chemists is analysis. So the skills of chemists is not just being in the lab, making all these medicines and drugs and all of that is actually be able to look at the indicators of the data and economy and also even with just banking and finance. So a lot of people who do chemists, um, you would be surprised where you find them at, in which industries. You could find them in banking, you could find it in finance, you can find them in business, find them in um, writing, analysis. Yeah just beautiful it's a skill set that a person with a synthetic chemist has is that ability to look at the things from the structure and pull it apart and give you some insight about what they're seeing so i'm hoping to be doing a lot of these analysis of different economy as indicators obviously it will still be around australia and south africa of course because this is sim sansi or starry we would still look at other major market like usa and others just to um yeah making sure that everything is all balanced and we're not gonna ignore the bricks as well as and just have a look at what they have in store for all of us, for us to consider and to think about. Yes, thank you guys for listening and having an interest in my channel. Please consider subscribing if you find any value in the videos that I post is free and the bell like button so you know when I post the new videos. Thank you guys. Have a lovely day. Bye for now.